Dajjal, the Muslim Antichrist, today on Makayo Messenger. Welcome in. It's great to have you here at Makayo Messenger. And I want to give some shout outs to Lake Girl, MP, Mark, Michelle, Sean, Robert, Loretta, Black Box, and WC there in the fellowship. And um, got kind of an exciting little uh, lesson to explore today with you about the Muslim Antichrist. Before I dive into that, please do hit that like bell, that subscribe button, that notification bell, and share these videos with others so they can learn about this exciting uh, exciting information and uh, and thank you so much for those who help support our channel uh, it really goes a long way to help our ministry so thank you for that if you haven't yet joined us in the fellowship I encourage you to do so you can do so by going to youtube.com forward slash Mikhail messenger forward slash join and uh, it's a great way to get to know us and and hang out with with other folks who think like you who are interested in these things so hopefully you'll join us there and uh, also um, I want to welcome all the new subscribers who have recently joined us so thank you so much for subscribing to our channel. If you haven't yet subscribed to Makayo Ministries, we do just straight up Bible study over there. It would be great to have you there as well. We're trying to hit a thousand subscribers, so hopefully you can help us hit that goal. So uh, the Muslim Antichrist. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> as if as if the Christian Antichrist wasn't enough already. We had to have a Muslim Antichrist to stir things up. But you know, everybody copies Christianity and and you know that's an understatement when it comes to Islam. Everything about Islam is is piggybacking off of Christianity. They even have entire chapters of their uh, Quran devoted to uh, Jesus and Mary. Uh, you know, you don't find that in the Christian Bible, right? Christian Bible stands on its own, stands alone. It doesn't have to reference other, you know, other religions to try to justify itself. But every other religion seems to have to do that because Christianity is the one way. It's the way, the truth, and the life. And so they have to kind of piggyback off of that and mirror that. And so, you know, similar to the Book of Mormon and so forth, where they just sort of uh, you know, try to uh, take from what is and try to create their own, cobble together their own religion, so to speak. So uh, it makes sense then that they would also have an antichrist. Uh, and, and in fact, they believe in Christ. They believe in Jesus. And that's a whole other story I will, we'll probably touch on a little bit here. But uh, mainly, I just wanted to do an overview. Uh, you know, when I do videos on this channel, it's things that I personally am excited about learning and want to know more about, and I'm just taking you along for the ride, if that's okay with you. And uh, and so that's basically what I'm doing here. You know, I came across uh, the Muslim Antichrist, was was curious about it. Uh, you know, like I saw this, this image of this guy, and I thought, who is this guy? You know, what is this all about, this Dajjal who looks kind of like Jesus and has got one eye closed and funny things on his nose, and what, what's going on here? What is this? So that's what I want to look at with you today. And boy, oh boy, as always, we've always find some interesting connections to things you didn't expect it to connect to. Um, everything from Jesus, of course, the Antichrist, the two witnesses, uh, the occult, uh, all kinds of interesting things are connecting here. So we're really just going to kind of touch the surface today. I mean, there's so much I could go off in a million different directions here uh, with this and may and hope to do that in the future. There are actually other end times figures that they have as well, uh, including uh, the, the, um, the Mahdi and, uh, and other end time figures. The Mahdi is their Messiah. So, you know, again, they, they're, it's copycat religion here, um, but it's interesting to see what, the, what parallels our, our religion and Christianity. And it's important to understand how other people think and, and what they're looking at and how they're, you know, if you want to reach out to a Muslim and help them become a Christian, it's good to understand what they believe so that you can kind of connect to them on that level. You know, uh, Paul did this in the book of Acts, uh, Acts 17, uh, where, where he says, you know, he, spoke, he was speaking to the Greeks, and he said, uh, you know, I noticed you have a lot of uh, statues to different gods, and, and in fact, I even found one to an unknown god. And he's like, what you declare is something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. And then he proceeded to tell them about, the, you know, Jesus and the God of, of, of the Israelites. And uh, the God of Israel. And so, you know, he took advantage of what they believed, right? And used that to his advantage to share the gospel with them. And so we want to do the same thing. And we want to understand what do Muslims believe? What, what is Islam all about? You know, most of what we hear is just sort of kind of radicalism. But we don't really hear a lot about what they believe. You know, what, what's, what, where are they coming from on this whole picture? And how can we connect 
perhaps and and win them to Christ ultimately is what the goal is here. But it is interesting how Satan is kind of working his weaving his web in such a way as to get you to you know is is to get them to you know it's it, and and even they say that about the Dajjal himself that he will call what is evil good and good evil, and they kind of do that a little bit. Um, even in reflecting upon Christianity, because uh, at this, you know, in one sense they believe in Jesus and they believe uh, in the Messiah, uh, but then they don't want to give him his proper place as the Son of God, and they attack those who do. So, and it's it's kind of an interesting, strange relationship they have with Jesus uh, in this whole thing, but. Uh, in any case, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of read through this, and then I'm going to bounce off to some 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 things that it kind of uh, triggers as as uh, as we go along here. I hope to do it in a relatively short fashion. Again, this is just sort of an overview. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Muslim uh, Antichrist as, as I wasn't, uh, then you hopefully you'll enjoy this. And even if you are familiar, I think you might find uh, we make some other interesting connections that you may not have thought of before. So uh, may God bless it. And here we go. Okay, so Al Mas. Uh, Ad Dajjal. Okay, the Al Masa Ad Dajjal uh, is Arabic, otherwise referred to simply as the Dajjal, is an evil figure in Islamic eschatology similar to the Antichrist in Christianity, who will pretend to be the promised Messiah, appearing before the Day of Judgment, according to. Let's see if I can make this a little bigger for you. According to. Um, uh, appearing, I'm sorry, appearing before the Day of Judgment, according to the Islamic eschato- eschatological narrative. Okay, so they have their end times narrative as well, just like Christians do. The Dajjal is never mentioned in the Quran, but he is mentioned and described in the Hadith literature. Now, this is interesting because it's very similar, again, that they have this other book, right, called the Hadith, similar to the Jews who have the Talmud. Okay, now the Talmud is the Jews' book of, of basically laws teaching you how to follow the law. So this is what Jesus was referring to when he says, you know, you hypocrites, you know, uh, your teachings are but rules taught by men. You know, you, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. And so they were holding to these traditions that are written in the Hadith or written in uh, the Talmud, for example, in, in Judaism, rather than following the Quran or the Torah. You know, so, so even in their religion, as false as it, as it, as it is, as much as it piggybacks on Christianity, um, even there they don't even follow you know, they bounce off to other writings, you know, and uh, and that's always it's just always indicative of any religion. Right. They never kind of stick to to what the word says. So in a similar fashion, they have this other book. And so that's where they're deriving this the whole Dajjal concept from. OK, so like in Christianity, the Dajjal is said to emerge out in the east, although the specific location varies among the various sources. The Dajjal will imitate the miracles performed by Isa. That's Jesus. OK, so they call Jesus Isa. OK such as healing the sick and raising the dead, the latter done with the aid of devils, he will deceive many people, such as weavers, magicians, half-castes, and children of prostitutes. Wow. Look out, weavers. Don't go, don't go weaving. Don't, 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 don't be a, don't be a stray weaver now. You know, you might be led astray. A very interesting group of people that get deceived. Okay. Weavers and magicians. Okay. And half-castes. All right, let's keep going here. So the the Dajjal is the superlative form of the root word Dajjal, Dajjal, meaning lie or deception. Well, that makes sense. It means deceiver and also appears in classical Syriac Dagala. The compound Al-Masa Al-Dajjal with the definite article Al, the refers to the deceiving Messiah, okay? A specific end time deceiver. And we're going to see how this kind of ties into Christianity end times as well in a little bit. The Dajjal is an evil being who will seek to impersonate the true Messiah. Okay, and that's basically how we would define uh, the Antichrist. Now, they put the true Messiah as Jesus. Okay, they put the true Messiah as Jesus. Now, that's interesting. So they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but then others would say, well, they believe Jesus is a helper of the Mahdi, who's the Messiah. Because if we go to Mahdi, he's, he's a messianic is a messianic figure who appears uh, shortly before the prophet Isa, Jesus, and leads Muslims to rule the world. So, so it's interesting. Like they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I mean, this is this is what's so crazy about this. So, in one sense, they attack Christians, yet they believe in Jesus and that he's the Messiah. So it's kind of crazy. It's kind of wild. Um, you know. So in that sense, they definitely differ from Judaism, and they're more like Christians than than Jews. 
because uh, you may have heard it said they're more like Jews and Christians, but actually, in this regard, it would be the opposite. A number of locations are associated with the emergence of the Dajjal, but usually he emerges from the east. Okay, now here's a here's an offshoot I'm going to do. You know, this is kind of like when you watch those movies and they have like a little button you can hit to learn more about this part of the movie or something. <laughs> well, that's what we're going to do a little bit here. Choose your own adventure. I'm going to go off on a few tangents. But this is what I want to talk about because this is what, what kind of drew me to this guy. I'm like, what is with his eye? You know, why is he blind in one eye? What's the significance of this? And so many things came to mind spiritually and biblically that kind of connect to that. So maybe it made me, me want to dig into that a little bit more. So it says he is usually described as blind in one eye, which eye he is blind in being uncertain and disputed by some. Both of his eyes are, however, considered to be defective at the least, with one being totally blind and the other protruding. Possessing a defective eye, and I'll get this, this is important. Possessing a defective eye is often regarded as giving more powers to achieve evil goals. Ah, Ah, okay. So let me read that one more time. Possessing a defective eye is often regarded as giving more powers to achieve evil goals. So by, in other words, by him having a defective eye, that actually gives him more evil power. Well, that definitely triggered some thoughts. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. What, what are we really talking about here? So here's this guy, right, with his eye. This is the Dajjal. Well, we're going to take a little journey on this one. I'm going, to, I'm going to come back. I'm coming back to that one. So just to let you know, I'm going off on a tangent here about this eye thing because there's some interesting biblical connections here, and then we're going to, we're going to circle back. Okay, so check this out. Um, so the owl's right eye. Okay, so this is something that is known even in Hong Kong as a protest symbol where the eye is closed, and you see it in a lot of revolutionary artwork, people covering their eyes and so forth. So I just want to kind of make a little nod to that before I go off on the rest of this tangent. Uh, but you'll see it in a lot in culture, this eye being closed. Uh, wearing of masks is also uh, part of this uh, connection with protesters in Hong Kong and so forth. Okay, that's kind of interesting. I wanted to share that with you before I dive into the rest of this. Okay, so the eye. What is it about the eye? Okay, very intriguing. Um, we know in pop culture, we see it all the time, right? They're covering their eyes. They're putting a, an OK sign or 666 sign over their eyes, right? We see that quite commonly uh, done all the time. And it's kind of part to show that they're in the club, so to speak. And this is where the occult nature comes in. Now, occult, just so you know, that word means uh, uh, something that's hidden, okay? Uh, compared to the word cult, which is like a, a group of, you know, uh, where you're kind of brainwashed in a cult or something like that. This is occult, which means hidden. When something is hidden, so these are signs that indicate something that you're hiding, something that's behind uh, the veil, so to speak. And so this is very popular in our culture where people are covering their eyes, they're putting triangles over their eyes, they're, they're putting their hands over their eyes, they're putting uh, OK signs or 666 signs over their eyes, etc. And I uh, just want to take you through some, some different imagery here. Um, famous people doing this. And uh, you kind of are kind of surprised at some of the people who are involved, but then again, not surprised because you know it's all part of the price of being part of that culture is you have to sell out to the big man, so to speak, and cover one eye. Okay, so then you've got this concept of the all-seeing eye and the all-powerful eye, right? And that's put inside of the triangle and on the symbolism and so forth. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, see no evil, you know, the whole concept of seeing no evil, right? Because the whole idea of this one eye being taken out is that you get more evil powers uh, with this eye being blinded. Um, back this off a little bit. You can read these a little bit better. Um, so kind of intriguing, okay, this whole connection with this eye. Of course, we see it on our dollar bill, right, on top of the pyramid. And... Um, and, of course, we saw it in Lord of the Rings, Sauron, the all-seeing evil eye, right? And then we see it even in fun ways, the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, right, in the culture. And uh, here you've got him kind of half standing in the shadow, uh, the whole thing of him being kind of half in the light and half in the darkness, you know, what's going on behind the darkness uh, there as well. And, um, 
And then you have this whole kind of initiation thing of com being completely blind. And I, and I think there's kind of a connection there of like you're, you go from being completely blind in, in their concept to then now you can see. And so now you have the one eye that is what's hidden, the hidden knowledge, and then the eye that is revealed to the rest of the world. So this is kind of part of their uh, whole culture, this idea of blinding. And so you think, well, where did this all come from? Could it harken back to this whole Dajjal concept? Um, and, you know, you could argue there's also the Egyptian eye as well and which came first and so forth. But could it harken back to their understanding the fact that they believe that that gives them more power, more evil power to have this blind eye, so to speak, uh, when really it's an eye of like secret knowledge, occult knowledge. And we see it in movies as well uh, where they're kind of promoting this idea of being blinded. Uh, here you have the the famous G.I. Joe and the dark side is blinded, but the, the light side can see, right? So interestingly, this ties into the Bible. Okay, and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna start, I'm, I'm going back to the Dajjal just a little bit, but I just I found this interesting, and I thought, hmm, because when you understand that Islam is based on the Bible, uh, all, you know, all all religion really is is harkens back to the father, <laughs> father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it all goes back there. So here in Genesis 20. Uh, you get this concept of the covering of the eyes. The phrase covering of the eyes is found in Genesis 20. It's translated literally uh, this way in Young's literal translation. The King James Version inserts the definite article, the. And let me just show you that scripture here in King James. It says, And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. Now, in this circumstance... Uh, this king had taken uh, the wife of Abraham, Sarah, who also was his half sister, um, but he was a little bit deceptive. You know, the apple doesn't fall from the tree. You know, Jacob's name is also known as the deceiver. Uh, if you didn't know that, um, when he uh, pulls onto his brother's uh, heel coming out of the uh, the womb, um, and uh, and so you know, he's the third. He's the, he's the grandson. Right, Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, and and then Isaac was blinded in his old old age too. So it all connects in a very interesting way here. And so Sarah, uh, basically, you know, Abraham was afraid that Abimelech would kill him. Uh, so he said, "Just say that you're my sister," which technically she was. So he wasn't exactly lying, but he wasn't being very forthright either. So in other words, he was kind of like hiding one eye. You could you could argue even, but that concept of there was one eye of truth and one eye of of a hidden truth, so to speak, the fact that they are actually married. And so Abimelech didn't know that, so he unknowingly took her to be his wife, and when found out that she was actually married to Abraham, he's like, how, how could you do this to me? Uh, you know, you bring a disgrace upon us, and here, take your wife back, and here's a thousand pieces of silver to make up for it, even though you should have told me that to begin with. Um, and so he calls, Abimelech calls, um, he calls Abraham, a covering uh, to her, a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all this. So it's a very interesting uh, phrase. And so let's just look at this a little bit here. Um, it says, The verse appears when King Abimelech of Gerar, speaking to Abraham, his wife Sarah, whom he has taken as his wife, thinking her Abraham's sister. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I've given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he's to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. It, thus she was repro reproved. One commentator has interpreted the phrase as implied advice to Sarah to conform to a supposed custom of married women and wear a complete veil. Ah, so we get the veil again, covering the eyes as well as the rest of the face, but the phrase is generally taken to refer not to Sarah's eyes but to the eyes of others and to be merely a metaphorical expression concerning vindication of Sarah, silencing criticism, allaying suspicions, righting a wrong, covering or recompensing the problem caused her, a sign of her innocence. The final phrase in the verse uh, which takes to mean she was reproved, is taken by almost all of the versions to mean instead she was vindicated and interprets it as such. Okay, Abimelech, Abimelech's statement to Sarah about the giving a thousand pieces is interpreted in the in the Midrash and sometimes elsewhere. We talked about the Midrash last time. That's the oral uh, law of, of uh, interpretation of the Talmud, which is interpreting the, interpret, interpreting the Tanakh, which includes the Torah. And sometimes uh, as the curse is retranslated, his eyes... Uh, in order to interpret it as the reason for Isaac's later blindness in his old age. See, in other words, he was, a, he was cursed with blindness because of what Abraham had done by essentially deceiving 
or at least not being forthright with Abimelech about the status of Sarah and him and their relationship. Such a curse was seen as righteously carried out. See, this is what they say in it in, in, in Judaism, that, that Isaac's curse was because of the sin of his father, essentially, since Abraham's deliberate, de- deliberate deceit was to blame for Abimelech's innocent error. And hence, his, its visitation on Abraham's son was considered just. That's interesting. You know, so we're talking about Abimelech here. Um, you know, we're talking about this idea of the blindness, right? And that, and that there's sort of a, um, a justice being done through this blindness. I'm going to move this over a little bit for you there. Um, so, uh, so interesting. More modern critical reading, simply uh, instruction to purchase a veil for Sarah. But it all has to do with veiling and hidden and deceit. You know, we know that the Dajjal is, is a man of deceit, of deception. So it's kind of interesting how this may harken back this whole idea of the eye connecting back even to Abraham's sin because they also believe in Abraham, right? There's a connection to Abraham there from Genesis 1. So everything always ends up going back to God and the Bible, right? So very interesting. Um, here, uh, ooh, this is in, in, in this, only an Islamic school of thought. It believes that a woman's uh, aura is up front is unrelated to her entire body. So again, even the whole idea of being veiled could go back, you know, that there's practice in, in Islamic uh, nations where they force women to uh, keep have the veil on their face um, can also harken back to this scripture as well. So very intriguing uh, indeed. And I think there was a couple other things I want to share on this. Okay, right. Jesus in John 9 says, if you were, uh, wait, actually before that, uh, well, that, that's a good one too. It says, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. This whole like, connection of blindness and um and guilt and, and, and deceit and, 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 and something you're hiding, crime. Um, here in Matthew 5, he says, uh, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And he also says, if your right hand causes you to stumble, remember this one because this is going to apply too. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. And then again, he says, uh, Further down here, he says, eye for an eye. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. So there's a whole connection with the eye and evil, also the hand and evil, right? And uh, here in Zechariah, he says, uh, uh, this is the plague with which the Lord will strike all the nations that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they're still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets. Their tongues will rot in their mouths. And uh, also, there's many scriptures about blindness and sin. Here in Zechariah, and this kind of leads into the next part of it, he says, uh, when, when Jesus said, you know, cut off your right hand or cut off your eye, here it says in Zechariah, it says, Woe to the worthless, ser- worthless shepherd, which you could apply to the Antichrist is the worthless shepherd, right? He's the Antichrist, the worthless shepherd, or the Dajjal in this case, who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. May his arm be completely withered, his right eye totally blinded. So again, it connects. There's this connection with the evil, the wicked shepherd, and having a blinded right eye. It also connects with the hand, which interestingly is also part of this occult symbolism. So you've got this idea of the right eye, or the eye being uh, blinded out, and then you have the, also the idea of the hand being withered as well. So again, this all goes back to, to the Bible, ultimately. It's where they're getting this concept. So it's almost like they're embracing that. They're saying, yeah, that's right. Uh, We are evil, and so we are going to get power from having that eye gouged out. We're going to get power from having that withered hand. That's that's their fallacy of thinking, this whole idea of hiding the hand. Well, and then the next step is the veil, right? Covering the face, covering the mouth. And where do you think all this is coming from, right? So... This is what they're putting into motion. They, have, they ultimately want to take away your humanity altogether, that you're not even going to be a human being anymore. They're just taking away everything from you and ultimately to blind you, to cover you, to erase you. And I thought about this. I'm like, you know, it's your face is a reflection of God because you are made in the image of God. And so what Satan can't stand to look at you, can't stand to see your face, right? And that's why the sat- Satanism wants to defile the body. You know, wants to put all kinds of piercings in the body and, and tattoos and, and just wants to defile that natural beauty that God has created in you. And it's not about winning a beauty contest. It's just the fact that you're made in God's image makes you beautiful. 
You know, God sees you as beautiful. You're made, you're a reflection of him. And so the satanic way is to want to defile all that and destroy all that because every time you look at it, it reminds you of the creator of God. And, you know, this happened with Moses uh, when he would meet with God, his face would radiate, you know, from being in the presence of God. It says when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him. So they were afraid because his face was radiant, right? Because they were, they were sinful, right? They were evil. I mean, you know, they, they had been worshiping golden calves and, you know, they weren't walking with God and they see this radiation. You know, that's how we're going to feel when we, when, you know, it says in, in, uh, in Matthew, when they, when they see him coming, on the clouds, right? Matthew 24, it says they're going to mourn when they see him because we're going to see him radiating and he's going to be so pure and holy. He's, he's been with the father. He's shining, right? And we're going to be humbled by that and, uh, and probably freaking out and mourning. I mean, we're going to be excited because we're looking forward to his return, but who knows exactly how we're going to feel, right? I'm sure we're still going to feel a sense of awe and a sense of wonder. And maybe even we, we may cry as well, you know, cry tears of joy, maybe some tears of shame. I mean, who knows? Who knows exactly how we're going to react, right? That's what the whole I can only imagine song is about, right? Because you don't really know how you're going to react when you see God. Uh, but uh, you just hope to be one that he loves and he, he takes to be with him. But but here he is coming back radiating. So when Moses, Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. So he hid the glory of God. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites so what he had been commanded, they saw his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. So, you know, he kind of humored them or, or you know, was willing to, uh, you know, to, 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 to cover himself over so that they wouldn't be uh, overwhelmed by his presence. But at the same time, that is a reflection of the light of God. And that's why Satan hates. He hates children. You know, children are so full of light and full of joy and so pure and so wholesome. You know, so it's like the younger you are, the more he hates you. You know, he just wants to kill you while you're still inside your mother. He just can't stand you, right? Can't stand that purity. Can't stand that, that creation, that reflection of Christ. So I thought all that was very intriguing. And um, as I was reading this about this one eye. Okay, now let's go back. Let's go back and read some more about the Dajjal. So he would travel the whole world, entering every city except Mecca and Medina. As a false messiah, it's believed that many will be deceived by him and join his ranks. Among them, Jews, Bedouins, weavers, <laughs> those pesky weavers, magicians, and children of fornication. Furthermore, he will be assisted by an army of devils. Uh, nevertheless, uh, maybe this is where the phrase weaving the web comes from, you know, weaving a web of evil or something. Nevertheless, the most reliable supporters will be the Jews to whom he will be, he will be the incarnation of God. Ah, okay, so we've been talking a lot about this idea of the, of the Jews Messiah, right? We've done videos of it on our channel. If you haven't checked that out, look up Jews Messiah on our channel. Um, I think I have a picture uh, somewhere. Is it this one? Yeah, this is a guy who's been pretty popular lately. People talking about as a possibility for their Messiah uh, who's supposedly doing miracles and so forth. And so they are they're basically saying that's who this Dajjal is going to be, is going to be who the Jews um, will be supporting. Right, the Dajjal will be able to perform miracles such as healing the sick, raising the dead, although only when supported by his devilish followers, it seems, causing. Well, that now that's interesting too, because Jesus couldn't even do miracles uh, in certain places because of the lack of faith. So that's kind of interesting. That only only if his followers uh, support him can he do the miracles, causing the earth to grow vegetation, causing livestock to prosper and to die, and stopping the sun's movement. That's very similar to what happened with Joshua. Stopping the sun. Now we know when the two witnesses come, they're going to be able to turn water to blood. They're going to stop the rain. And we're going to get to them in a, in a second. But his miracles will resemble those performed by Isa. That's Jesus. At the end, uh, see Isa in Islam, Jesus is believed to be the penultimate prophet. So see, they believe in Jesus. They just don't believe he's the ultimate prophet. They still think Muhammad is the ultimate prophet uh, because they don't understand Jesus. At the end, the Dajjal will be defeated and killed by Isa when the latter simply looks at him and according to some narrations, puts a sword through the Dajjal. Now, puts a sword through the Dajjal. That's very interesting because that's what Jesus does when he comes back. Uh, we know in Revelation 19, when Jesus comes with the armies of heaven, it says, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And then at the end it says, the rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And that's Jesus and all the birds gorge themselves on their flesh. 
So that's kind of intriguing that he's got this sword coming out of his mouth. That's what they say about uh, Isa. They say that about Jesus as well. And they believe he has a sword coming out of his mouth that will kill the Dajjal. The nature of the Dajjal is ambiguous, although the nature of his birth indicates that the first generations of Muslim apocalyptists regarded him as human. He's also identified rather as a devil in human form in the Islamic tradition. The characteristical one eye is believed to symbolize spiritual blindness, right? We see that with Jesus too when he's talking about it. So it's very interesting that they would they would play off of that. I'm sure, again, this was not written in the, the Quran, even though the Quran is based on the Bible. I'm sure they heard a lot of Christian teaching and they're just sort of incorporating it into their teaching. Thus, the Dajjal, blind to the, to the imminent aspect of God, could only comprehend the transcendent aspect of God's wrath. Hadiths describe the Dajjal as twisting paradise and hell as he would bring his own paradise and hell with him, but his hell would, would be paradise and his paradise would be hell. Sounds kind of like what we're living in now, right? With the world the way that it is. Some Sunni Muslims have affirmed that the Dajjal is an individual man and that when the Dajjal appears, he will stay for 40 days. Now, that's interesting because that's a very biblical time frame, 40 days. One like a year, one like a month, one like a week, and the rest of the days like normal days. Now, I thought this was interesting, so I decided to throw this in a calculator and see what came out. Okay, so um, so is 40 days, right? And one is like a year. Now, depending on how you count that year, is it going to be 365 a year or is it going to be a prophetic year of 360 that we, believe, you know, that we see in Judaism? But in any case, let's take a 365 year, right? And then you add to that, and one was like a month. Now, is that a 31-day month? Is that a 30-day month, right? So we're not really sure about that. And then one is a, uh, a week, right? And then one is uh, like... Uh, well, then the rest of the days were normal, right? So that'd be like 439, right? Um, but if you make it a 31-day month, it's 440. So uh, I didn't do much with 439, but I did look at 440 a little bit. So I thought that'd be interesting and to share with you a little bit. Now, that's if you did it. Um, that's if you did the 440, uh, you know, with a 365-day calendar. So let me just show you that uh, real quick here. So 440... Interestingly, uh, now this is talking about the Dajjal, like, right, just, just, to, just to show you this. Sorry, my, my mic stand is falling apart here. Okay, so uh, if you go to the, uh, here where it says 40 days, one like a year, one like a month, one like a week, the rest of the days like normal days. 30, you know, so, so basically 37 days and one day is a year, one day is a month, one day is a week. Okay, just, just so you understand where I got that. So if it's 440 that we're talking about, Interestingly, when I put, um, oh, not this one. Hold on a second. Oh, here's 440. Uh, okay, so when I put the number 440 into Gematria, interestingly, it, it equals the Antichrist. So I thought that's pretty intriguing. Uh, twice, you got Antichrist here, Antichrist here as well. Um, and then it also, it also equals Prince of Peace. It equals King of Israel. It equals another false flag. I thought that's kind of interesting too. Um, and, uh, let me go down here. I think there were a couple other ones that were kind of intriguing in here. So 440 kind of came up as an interesting number, uh, in connection with that Red Sea moment. That's kind of interesting. Um, and, uh, and I think there were, there might've been a few, a few others in here too, but in any case, so that was kind of intriguing in and of itself, uh, that, 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 that's the number of days that it equals 440. Um, then I also did the calculation on if I took out the five days, how, how did I do that? I think I did it as, uh, and you guys can play with these numbers too, but I, I think what I did is I, I, I ended up with 434 because I think what I did is I took the, I took a 360 day and a 30 day month and I got 434, which was interesting because it was chiasmus and I, I looked up that one and 434 gave me some interesting things too. Uh, serpentine was one of them. Illuminate, I thought that was an interesting connection with the occult side of things. Um, and uh, and I thought that, oh, <laughs> reptilians is in here too. That's kind of interesting. Uh, and uh, genetic codes, mm, just saw that one. That's kind of, kind of cool. The land of Goshen, which is where we all wanna be protected when all this goes down. Uh, time of no time. Oh, that's interesting. He will change the times and seasons and the season, it says there. Um, and the final push, that's kind of interesting. The great deluge or the flood. 
So interesting there as well. So I thought that was kind of uh, intriguing uh, to take a look at those numbers a little bit. And, and then I just want to show you in contrast to that, uh, we have Jesus who's 444. So you have 434 and 444. And then 74 is Jesus also. And when you put in, um, and the Asus is also 444 and 88. But when you put in, I think it was Isa, which is the name of Jesus in Arabic, it's 174. So there, there's the 74 again. So I thought that was interesting. And when I scrolled down on that one, found some interesting connections like Bride is in here. Um, Abaddon, which is the destroyer, that, that ties into the Antichrist uh, returning as well. And um, I'm God, you know, Allah, Allah. So that that's intriguing. Again, this was just putting the number in, or no, I put in Isa, I guess. So Allah, Allah, I'm God. Um, so all that's very uh, intriguing also. So just kind of want to share a little bit of that with you. All right, let me keep going here. So it says, sometime after the appearance of the Dajjal, Isa will descend on a white minaret to the east of Damascus. Okay, so this this is the white minaret that he's supposedly going to descend on. I think I have a few other pictures of this. Um, this is supposedly where Jesus is, is going to des descend according to Islam. Uh, again, we believe he's going to uh, land on the Mount of Olives. That's what it says in the Bible. Uh, but this is where they think he's going to come down. Not sure why he would come down on a white minaret here, but that's, that's what they're thinking, uh, the white minaret. Um, okay, so that's kind of intriguing. Okay, let's keep going here. So um, just kind of want to give you an idea of this so that you can kind of talk intelligently on the subject, you know, <laughs> and me too. You know, I just I want, I want to educate us here about who is this Dajjal guy. Okay. And to understand the thinking and what, what the Muslims are thinking, uh, because I've heard this before. They believe in Jesus and the Messiah. I'm like, well, that's interesting. I want to understand this better. So sometime after the appearance of the Dajjal, Isa or Jesus will descend on the white minaret to the east of Damascus. Now, you know, Damascus, we know, plays a big role in end time eschatology. Uh, we're waiting for uh, Damascus to be wiped out, actually. Sorry to say. But uh, that's also in Isaiah 17, I believe, um, where Damascus is supposed to be wiped out as well. So it's kind of interesting. It's east of Damascus that they're thinking this is going to happen. Thought to be, you know, it's not Medina or Mecca or one of their big cities or something. So it's interesting that's where they think it's going to be. Thought to be in the one located in the um Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, which is what we just looked at. He will descend from the heavens wearing two garments lightly dyed with saffron. Okay, so there's kind of the idea of, you know, Jesus coming back in the red garment of blood, right? Um, so, and his hands resting on the shoulders of two angels. Although is saffron red or is it yellow? I have to look that up here. Um, and his, his uh, hands resting on shoulders of two angels. When he lowers his head, it will seem as if water is flowing from his hair. When he raises his head, it will appear as though his hair is beaded with silvery pearls. Every non-Muslim who, who would smell the odor of his self would die. <laughs> what? Okay, every non-Muslim who smells his own body odor will die. Is that, what, is that what you're saying here? According to the Sunni hadith, the Dajjal will then be chased to the gate of Lod where he will be captured and killed by Isa. Okay, so they're saying the Antichrist will be killed by Jesus. Okay, Jesus will then break the Christian cross. Okay, so he's saying Isa will break the Christian cross. So here's sort of this kind of double think. You know, in one sense they believe in Jesus, but then they're, they're, they, they're against the cross and they believe that modern Christianity is is really the 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 evil of the world in fact some other phase they believe that that is the dajjal that that's you know the the, the great devil as they want and want to destroy so it's kind of ironic isa will break the christian cross they say kill all the pigs abolish the jizya tax and establish peace among all the nations the following account describes one of the signs of the arrival of the dajjal in sunni eschatology um it says uh it will happen in the yathrib uh the outbreak of the great war will be the conquest of constantinople so we're talking about Turkey here. Uh, he, the prophet, struck his thigh in his shoulder and his hand. Uh, this is as true as you are sitting here. Okay, interesting. There will be 30 Dajjals among my Ummah. Each one will claim he is the prophet, but I am the last of the prophets, and there will be no prophet after me. The hour will not be established until two big groups fight each other, whereupon there will be a great number of casualties on both sides, and they will be following one in the same religious doctrine until about 30 Dajjals appear, and each of them will claim that he is Allah's apostle. Okay. Muhammad also stated that the last of these Dajjals will be the Islamic Antichrist al masa al-Dajjal, the deceitful Messiah. Uh, okay, and that's basically what we read before. This Dajjal was never mentioned before, so I'm going to skip over this part. The weavers and the magicians. Boy, those pesky weavers. Hadith also reported on the greater signs of the end, reappearance of the prophet Jesus to join the battle. Uh, Mahadi, the guided one. 
and another. Uh, so it sounds like they see Isa or Jesus as the Messiah and the Mahadi is also a messianic figure called the guided one, but not necessarily the Messiah. It's interesting. Uh, after three hours gone by in the hand of Jesus, 70,000 of the Jews of Isfahan will follow the Dajjal wearing tayalisas. Ta- ta- okay, that's interesting. Um, I had a picture of a tayalisa here somewhere. Let me see if I can find it. Taya little Lisa. Da, 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 da. Where is it? Where are you, Taya Lisa? Men have named you. Uh, Taya Lisa. Oh, I forget where it is. I had it here somewhere. No, not that one. No, not that one. Where is it? This one? No. Uh, I had a picture of a Taya Lisa. Taya, oh, here it is. Taya Lisa. There it is. So that's the Taya Lisa, right? That's what. Jews wear, you know, when they're in their, in their prayer shawl. It's their prayer shawl, essentially. And they're saying, but it's interesting how it kind of ties in to this imagery um, of being completely covered. I just had it. Where, where'd it go? Just had it open here. Was it this one? Yeah. It's kind of interesting, just the concept of this Taya Lisa, um, the idea of covering and being blinded and covering your head. It's just not an interesting symbolism going on here. So, Anyway, they, they believe that 70,000, now that's an interesting number. We know 70, uh, they talk about the 70 nations of the Jews of the diaspora and the 70,000 Jews. So that's what they believe is going to be wearing tiny leases and following the Dajjal. Okay, so again, the, their Dajjal is the, is the Jews' uh, Messiah. That's, that's what they're believing here. Uh, Verily by Allah, the last hour will not come until the 30 Dajjals will appear and the final one will be the one-eyed false Messiah. He's a one-eyed, one hundred people leader. Okay, there's a never a prophet who has not warned the Ummah that of that one-eyed liar. Behold, he is a one-eyed, and your Lord is not one-eyed. Amen. Dajjal is blind of one eye. On his forehead are the letters KFR. Now, this is interesting, too. Okay, uh, between the eyes of the Dajjal, which every Muslim would be able to read. So, if you look at this picture here, uh, you see that little writing between his eyes there. In a sense, it's kind of reflective of the mark of the beast, which is kind of interesting as well. The whole idea that on their forehead or on their hand, right, you have this mark, and this uh, Antichrist has this mark on his forehead, KFR, the initials. Now, I'm not going to say that word because it's actually uh, a, a, a derogatory term in, uh, in South Africa. Uh, but it's interesting. This is the term that they use, okay? And... Uh, it's an Arabic and Islamic term, which in the Islamic tradition refers to a person who disbelieves in God as per Islam or denies his authority or rejects the tenets of Islam. So basically, that's what they would call you. Uh, another term is often translated as infidel, right? You've probably heard that. A pagan, a rejecter, a denier, a disbeliever, an unbeliever, a non-believer, a non-Muslim. So this is what they kill people for, right? So they would call you this name. Well, you may think this sounds very similar to uh, the ethnic slur that has been used in uh, South Africa. That's because it is directly derived from it. Um, it says uh, it's derived from the Arabic word uh, meaning non-believer, particularly of Islam in the form of it evolved from its religious or- origins during the pre-colonial period in Eastern and Southern Africa. So that same term, um, was derived uh, from Arabic. It has Arabic origins. Uh, it says uh, where the term was adopted by colonists in reference to the monotheistic non-Islamic Bantu peoples, and it was eventually used in reference to any person uh, during <laughs> person of of African origin uh, during the apartheid era. This designation came to be considered a pejorative by the mid 20th century, and today is considered extremely offensive. Okay. Right. That's the reason I'm not saying that word. Okay, but uh, but in any case, that's where it came from. It actually came from this word that defines a Muslim non-believer, which is what will appear on the head of this Dajjal Antichrist. So that, too, is very intriguing, right? Okay, let's keep going here. Um, so... The Mahdi, okay, the rightly guided one, is the redeemer according to Islam, okay? Just like the Dajjal, the Mahdi is never mentioned in the Quran, but his description can be found in the Hadith literature. According to the Islamic eschatological narrative, he will appear on earth before the day of judgment, at the time of the second coming of Christ. (laughs) 
I mean, you can't make this up. You know, it's like they don't believe he's Christ, but they believe in his second coming. It's like, go figure. So, yes, they do. They believe in the second coming of Christ, guys. And, and, and they believe in, and, and that's Jesus. See, the second coming of Christ, they believe it's the coming of Jesus. Okay, we're, we're not talking about Muhammad here. We're talking about Jesus. Okay, so Muslims believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay, I know. It's crazy. The prophet Isa shall return to defeat and kill al Masa al-Dajjal. I mean, they're right. They're right about that. So, I mean, they got that part down. They just need to <laughs> accept him as their Lord and Savior, and then, then we'll have something. Muslims believe that both Isa and the Mahdi, but this is why I'm sharing this with you, because now you can go share your faith with the Muslim, and you got something to talk about. You, get, you, have, a, you have some common ground you can both agree on. I mean, think about this. Did you ever think that you and Muslims both, both can agree on the second coming of Jesus Christ? I don't think, you know, unless you're already familiar with that, but most people will be surprised by that, I think. Um, so the prophet Isa, or Jesus, shall return to defeat and kill the Antichrist, which is what we believe, right? So pretty awesome, right? Pretty awesome. That's a great starting point where you can talk to somebody about end times and, and, and share your faith with the Muslim. Muslims believe that both Isa and the Mahdi will rid the world of wrongdoing, okay? Now, why do they believe this? It's because it's based on Christianity. Uh, Islam is based on Christianity just like Mormonism is. It's, it's you know, two guys who didn't like what they saw, so they went off and made their own, their own religion. Supposedly an angel, in both cases, gave them the rise and no one else. Uh, you know, so the Bible says if even an angel preaches the gospel other than what we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. So whether it was an angel or not uh, is up for debate, but either way, it ain't right, right? But um, but in any case, Muslims believe that both Isa and the Mahdi will rid the world of wrongdoing. So, okay, so, so in other words, Jesus and this Mahdi are not the same person, but they are two, two different entities uh, working together. They're like a partnership, okay? And they'll rid the world of wrongdoing, injustice, and tyranny, ensuring peace and tranquility. Eventually, the Dajjal will be killed by the Mahdi and Isa at the gate of Lud, who upon seeing Dajjal will cause him to slowly dissolve like salt in water. Oh, that's why I had that scripture open. Because I had a scripture open, you are the salt of the earth, right? And I was like, why do I have that scripture open? You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Isn't that interesting? So it's kind of like you see all this influence of Christianity. You see all this Bible coming through their beliefs because they don't have anything to base their beliefs on because it's a false religion. So they have to base it on Christianity. Christianity stands alone, you know. Uh, Judaism stands alone. Right. They, they stand together, but they stand alone. You know, they're not based on other religions. Right. But these other religions have to kind of base everything off Christianity because it is the truth. So um, so it's very interesting. Who upon seeing this all will cause them to slowly dissolve. I'm melting. Oh, what a world. What a world. Like salt and water, like the wicked witch from Wizard of Oz will slowly dissolve away. Now, that's kind of, again, kind of interesting. It uh, goes back to that scripture I read to you about um, you know, the sockets in their eyes. What was, where is that? Zechariah 14 here it says their eyes will rot in their sockets, their tongues will rot in their mouths, their, they, their flesh will rot while they're standing on their feet, right? Sounds kind of similar to that, uh, that concept of just dissolving. Okay, so since the 80s, popular Islamic writers such as Saeed Ayyub of Egypt have blamed the forces of Dajjal for the overtaking of the Islamic world by the Western states. So here's what I was talking about. So they actually, they actually think it's the Dajjal that's working through modern day Christianity. <laughs> even though they believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. I know, it's crazy. In the Twelver denomination of Shia Islam, one of the signs of the reappearance of the Mahdi, whom Twelvers consider to be their twelfth iman from the al abait I'll have a bite. People of the household is the advent of the Dajjal. Whoever denies al-Mahdi has, de has de denied God, and whoever accepts al-Dajjal has denied God, turned an infidel. Okay, whoever denies al-Mahdi has denied God, and whoever accepts Okay, I think that's pretty straight. The Shia hadith attributed to Muhammad strongly emphasized the return of Dajjal, the event of the reappearance of the Mahdi. The following is a 12 -er. So it's like they, they kind of, it's like, it's sort of like what the Jews did, like incorporating other religions into their religion. Like, okay, yeah, or what the Romans did. Like, yeah, okay, you can have your gods and we'll kind of mix it with our gods and we'll give it another name and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And that's what the Jews were doing when they're worshiping on the high places and combining false gods with their gods so it's kind of what they're doing here in islam it's like well okay yeah we'll take jesus in but we're not going to let him be like the main dude but you know he's pretty important he'll come back you know he'll, he'll fight the dajjal but ultimately it's the mahdi and you know muhammad you know they're they're more important so it's kind of like you know they it's like they're they're compromising or something here narrated to us and, and that's what they do in the quran as well you know one of the first couple chapters of the quran one's about jesus one's about mary um so you should check that out anyway um Mm, 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 mm. Okay, let me keep going here. 
I'm just kind of skimming over this. He should be mounted on a white ash. Oh, so there's the white horse. Uh, one step of that ash will be a one mile. Whichever spring or well reaches, he will call out aloud, which will be audible to all the east. That's interesting. Uh, Muhammad. So this is talking about Muhammad. Let's see. Omala. Who would who would be the Dajjal? Oh, 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 interesting. Mm. So the, okay, oh, yes. Glad I didn't skip this. The name of Dajjal is Saeed bin Saeed. But this white ash thing is interesting, too, because that ties into the first C uh, the, uh, of the, the uh, in, in Revelation 6, uh, the rider on the white horse, potentially. Okay, but let's take a look at this first. The name of the Dajjal is Saeed bin Saeed. <laughs> Saeed bin Saeed. Okay, so Saeed means blessed, okay? Um, now check this out. So I was looking this up, and I was like, wow. Okay, so Saeed ibn Zaid. Okay, there's kind of two of these guys. Now, interestingly, there's a Saeed ibn Zaid, also known uh, as Kunya Abu Awar, was a companion of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Saeed has been described as a tall, hairy, dark-skinned man. Tall, hairy, dark-skinned man. Okay, so he was a friend, uh, a companion of Muhammad. So not a bad guy, right? It's supposed to be a good guy. Saeed became a Muslim not later. And I think he actually, after Muhammad, he's one of the leaders of, uh, let's see, his wife Fatima at first becomes a secret. Saeed joined the general immigration during the time of caliphs. Yeah, he was governor of Kufa. So, I mean, he was one of the leaders there who governed. Uh, Saeed participated in all the other battles in which Muhammad personally fought. He served as Muhammad's secretary and recorded the verses of the Quran. Okay, so suppose this is the guy who supposedly wrote down the Quran, right? Ah, interesting. And, wow, that, that is interesting because that almost makes you wonder about the angel. You know, is this the angel of death, so to speak, uh, the same one who confused the world, who gave a false religion, who, who wrote down these things, uh, comes back as the Antichrist. Because it says Saeed ibn Saeed, right? And uh, Saeed, again, means blessed or happy or good luck, joy, etc. Uh, but then you see this Saf ibn Saeed. Um, now, here's how they're saying it. They're saying Saf ibn, ibn Saeed, but if you remember here in this writing, it literally says Saeed bin Saeed. Saeed, you see that? Saeed bin Saeed. So, that's intriguing. So, okay, so this Saf ibn Saeed, very similar names, right? Um, whoop, sorry, not that one. Saeed ibn Saeed, Zaid, and Saf ibn Zaid, also known as Abdullah ibn Saeed, was an alleged claimant of prophethood during the time of Islamic prophet Muhammad and his companions who later disappeared after the Riddle Wars. So you've kind of got two stories. One says he's his friend. He's the guy who wrote down the Quran. Another guy says it sounds like he was... Um, well, let me just keep going. Umar and even some scholars today speculate that he might be the Ad Dajjal, who would later come in the world of false messiah. So another group believes he's the, he's the Dajjal. He's actually the enemy of Islam to them, right? Or the enemy of Christ. He was born in an Arabian Jewish family. Ah, an Arabian Jewish family. Ah, interesting. So see, they believe it's a Jewish uh, antichrist. And that's why some say their antichrist is our Christ. Uh, but I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's more like the Jews' false messiah is their antichrist, right? From his name, his father might be a fisherman. Of course, fishers of men. As Saeed means fisherman in Arabic. Ah, interesting, fishers of men. His hostility towards Muhammad since childhood led scholars to speculate that he is Ad Dajjal. Uh, Ibn Sa'id claimed he was a prophet when he was on the threshold of adolescence. It was initially believed to be the false messiah, Dajjal, and his, as his characteristics were the same as those of the false messiah. It was narrated that Muhammad met Ibn Sa'id. At that time, Ibn Sa'id was just at the threshold of adolescence. Muhammad said, don't you bear testimony to the fact that I am the messenger of Allah? Ibn Sa'id said, I bear testimony that you are the messenger of the illiterate. Oh, oh, oh it's a snap. After Ibn Zaid, Sa'id just about being a prophet, Umar ibn Khattab decided that the child deserved death and asked Muhammad for permission to execute him. Whoa! Thereupon, Muhammad said, If he is that person, the Dajjal, who is, who is in your mind, you will not be able to kill him. And if he is not, then killing will not do you any good. Well, that's for sure. He, he got that part right. Okay, so interesting, right? Interesting, intriguing stuff. Okay, a lot to dig into there. I'm just trying to give you a taste here. Okay, so that's Ibn Sa'id, but... Well, it's interesting. Let's keep going. Thus, one who supports him is unfortunate or, or, or fortunate who deny him. He shall emerge from Yahudiyah, village of Isfahan. On his forehead would be inscribed, inscribed 
the KFR that we talked about, which would re be readable to the, to the literate as well as the illiterate. And Muhammad just called him, actually, he just called Muhammad, the Sayyid guy, uh, leader of the illiterate. Well, that's interesting. And if you remember, Muhammad was illiterate as well. And, and the whole miracle, supposedly, that he performed was that he wrote down the Quran, having never studied how to read or write. Um, so that's interesting parallel, too. Boy, you almost kind of wonder if Muhammad even existed, right? It's, it almost seems like, it starts to sound like some sort of tall, the whole thing sounds like, uh, you know, like a legend. He shall jump into the seas, the sun will follow him. You know, that's the same thing they made up about the Dome of the Rock, so that they could try to lay claim to the Dome of the Rock, that, oh, yes, he, he went on Pegasus, uh, you know, and flew into the heavens from the Dome of the Rock, therefore it's holy to us. You know, they're just trying to claim it, they're just trying to steal it from the Jews. He shall jump into the seas, the sun will follow him, a mountain of smoke will precede him, and a white mountain will follow him, which in times of famine will be mistaken to be a mountain of food, bread. He shall be mounted on a white ash. Okay, I take that to be a white horse. One step of that ash will be of one mile. Whichever spring or well he reaches will drive forever, which is interesting because I believe Muhammad also went on a white flying horse into the heavens. Uh, kind of interesting parallels here, you know, with Revelation 6, talking about the, the rider on the white horse. He will call out aloud, which shall be audible to all in the east and the west from the jinns, humans, and the satans. Hmm, more than one. He would tell his followers that he is their Lord, whereas he would be a one-eyed one, one man with human needs, and God does not have any needs, nor he, nor he has an eye. Um, right, God has both his eyes. Muhammad strongly warned his companions and believers about this deceiving claim. According to a tradition, Al-Dajjal will verily be given birth to his mother in Qus in Egypt, and there will be 30 years separating between his birth and appearance. Shia uh, reports regarding Isa state that he will descend in the Damascus East Gate, then he will appear in the East, there he will be granted caliphate. This is a narration by Nuyam bin Hamad, also according to the Hadith of Jasasa. It is reported that he is confined in an abbey or a, play, a palace at an island in the Sham or the Sea of Yemen. Some Hadith reports that he will emerge from Khorasan. Oh, Khorasan, interesting. Uh, whereas some say uh, he will appear in a place between the Sham and Iraq. People will be deceived by his magic and sorcery for which he will be falsely claimed as Messiah. On the first day of his appearance, 70,000 Jews will follow him. So it really is the Jewish Messiah we're talking about here. They will be wearing green caps. They will consider him as their promised Savior, the one who is described in their holy books, the actual cause of their faith. And we know they'll be wearing those uh, hayasalas or tayalasas. Yeah, they'll be wearing those. Uh, the actual cause of faith will be animosity with the Muslims. Nearest to Prophet Muhammad, most of Dajjal's followers would be people from illegitimate relationships, habitual drinkers, singers, ah, those singers, musicians, ah, musicians, Bedouins and women. He will travel all around the world except Mecca and Medina. The earth would be under his control to such an extent that even the ruins will turn into treasures and the earth will sprout vegetation on his command. As soon as he descends, he will order a river to flow and then return and then dry up. Hey, speaking of rivers, did you see that river over there in uh, Petra? Pretty cool. The river will follow his command. Even the mountains, clouds, and wind will be controlled by him. Due to his, his followers will gradually increase, which will eventually make him proclaim himself as God. Eh, yeah, might as well. Okay, so yeah, so he basically is going to proclaim himself as God, which we know the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to set himself up in the temple of God. But interesting, they, they're associating with the, with the Jews. A hadith from the prophet indicates the condition of the world. He said, five years prior to the advent of Dajjal, there shall be drought, Nothing shall be cultivated. Hmm, that's interesting. We've kind of been experiencing some droughts in places, such that all the hoofed animals shall perish. Well, that's extreme. After his emergence, the world would be facing acute famine. But we know that that ties into Revelation, right? About the a third of the cattle dying and so forth. After his emergence, the world will be facing acute famine. He will have food and water with him. Hmm. Come to me. Take my mark upon you, and you will have food and water to eat. Hoo hoo drink many people will accept his claim just for some food and water wow so we were talking mark of the beast again here this is what they believe he will spread oppression and tyranny all over the world the main aim of the Dajjal will be mischief ah that mischievous guy test of the people well that's for sure the one who follows him will be exalted from islam and the one who denies him will be the believer when the mahadi reappears he will appoint isa jesus as his representative <laughs> right jesus well it's interesting. If you, if, you, if you wanted to say that the Mahdi was the father in heaven, now that would change things up. You know, if you want to do some parallels here, if the Mahdi is really the father and Jesus is, is the mediator between God and man. So that's interesting parallel. Isa would attack him and catch him at the gate of Lud, present today Lod, near Tel Aviv. According to the narrations of Ali, when the Mahdi returns, he will lead the prayers and Isa will follow him. Now, ultimately, we will live together with the father and the son in the new Jerusalem. 
So kind of an interesting connection there. As soon as the Dajjal sees Isa, Jesus, Dajjal would melt like lead. What about the sword coming out of his mouth? Oh no, I'm melting. All mentions Dajjal's defeat in one of his sermons, saying that Dajjal will set out toward the Hijaz, and Isa, Jesus, will intercept him at the passage of Harsha. Seems Harsha. Isa will direct a horrible shout at him and strike him a decisive blow. Yeah, go Isa! Woo! Muhammad al-Bakir narrated that at the time when Dajjal will arise, the people would not know about God, hence making it easy for the Dajjal to claim himself as God. God, God who? Now that's interesting. Amos 8 talks about there'll be a famine in land, not a famine of, of food, actual physical food, but of, of the word of God. People won't know the word of God. So there's something to be said to that. Prophecies concerning the emergence of the Dajjal are interpreted in Ahmadiyya teachings as designating a specific group of nations centered upon a false theology of Christology. See, instead of an individual with reference to the Dajjal and the singular indicating its unity as a system rather than its personal. See, they, they think Christology is actually the devil. So it's like they believe in the second coming of Christ, but they think Christology is, is bad. Uh, uh, to the Dajjal and the singular indicating its unity as a system rather than its personal individuality. In particular, Amadis identify the Dajjal collectively with the missionary expansion and colonial dominance of European Christianity. See, so they associate the Dajjal with Christianity. So that's why they talk about the white devil and that they want to kill, you know, America and, and Israel and so forth, because that's how they connect it, even though they believe in Jesus as being the Christ. Throughout the world, they just think we have it wrong about him. Oh, you got so wrong about him? Throughout the world, a development which had begun soon after the Muslim conquest of Constantinople with the age of discovery in the 15th century and accelerated by the Industrial Revolution. So that's why, see, this helps you understand why do they want to kill America so much? Why do they want to take out the West? Why are they always saying death to the infidels, you know, and trying to take us out uh, because we're technologically advanced and all this stuff, even though they're technologically advanced. Aren't they the ones creating drones and sending them over? Right, come on. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, hypocrisy at its finest. With the age of discovery in the 15th century, celebrated the Industrial Revolution, as with other eschatological themes, Mizra Guha Mama, the founder of Ahmadiyya movement, wrote extensively, extensively on this topic. The identification of the Dajjal principally with the colonial missionaries. Okay, see, that's how this particular group. Now, this isn't necessarily all groups. This is uh, prophecies concerning the are interpreted in Am Ahmadiyya. Well, maybe it is. Um, the, the other one was this particular group. This is the Am Ahmadiyya teachings. Uh, their beliefs. This is their beliefs and practices of Islam. Mm, okay. So the identification of the Dajjal principle of, with colonial missionaries was drawn by Ghulam Ahmad through linking the Hadith traditions about him with certain Quranic passages such as inter alia, the description of the Hadith, of uh, the emergence of the Dajjal as the greatest tribulation since the creation of Adam. Ah, see, so they believe in the greatest tribulation since the creation of Adam. That's biblical, right? Adam, uh, Daniel talks about that, right? It's the greatest time of trouble, no time like before or after, Daniel 12. Uh, you know, Revelation obviously refers to that. And, uh, and elsewhere, Jesus talks about it, Matthew 24, uh, you know, and, and elsewhere, talking about this being the greatest uh, time of destruction ever on earth. And so this is what they believe as well when the Dajjal comes. Taken in conjunction with the Quran's description of the, of the de deification of Jesus as the greatest abomination. Ah, okay, so us seeing Jesus as God, uh, or the Word of God, or the Son of God. So this is where they can't get their mind around. It's, it, and they, it, here's, here's, here's my response to that. It's like... They say, well, how could God have a son? This is, this is the whole thing in the Quran. If you read the Quran, uh, when it talks about Jesus. It says, you know, he's, yes, he was a prophet, and yes, he was good, did all these nice things, but he can't be God's son because God can't have a son. So are you saying that you can do something that God can't do? Aren't you made in God's image? If you can have a son, then why in the world couldn't God have a son? Of course he can have a son. He can have as many sons as he wants, <laughs> and he can do a lot more than that. I mean, it's so ridiculous uh, who are we to say that we're God and we're telling God what to do? You know, we're going to say, no, God, you can't have a son. I, who are you to say that? In fact, we know it from Psalms. Uh, you kiss the son lest he be angry with you, right? Do you know God and do you know his son, right? The Bible says uh, many times to us a son is born, uh, a child is, is uh, you know, a given, and, and he will be called wonderful God, a mighty God, a wonderful counselor, uh, everlasting father, prince of peace, right? So it's throughout the scriptures. And, yet, and even in Genesis 1, you know, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Who is he talking to? And yet he makes him in his own image. How could it be his own, yet it's a plural? You know, so there's a lot there in the Bible, obviously, um, that, that demonstrates the Trinity, the idea of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even Jesus himself said, Matthew 28, go and baptize them in the name of my, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When Jesus himself was baptized, you had the Father speaking, you had the Holy Spirit descending, and you had the Son. 
So, you know, you always have that connection, but, but they, they can't get their minds around it. The Pharisees couldn't get their minds around it, right? And yet it's all over the Bible. If they just knew their Bible, you'd see it very clearly. And who are you to think that you could have a son and God can't have a son? That doesn't even make sense, right? Didn't he make you in his image? So therefore, if you can do it, he can do it. The warning only against the, the putative lapses of the Jews and Christians in Al-Fatiha, the principle of Islamic prayer, and the absence therein of any warning specifically against the Dajjal, a prophetic hadith which described, prescribed the recitation of the opening and closing 10 verses of chapter 18 of the Quran as a safeguard against the mischief of the Dajjal, the former of which speak of a people who assign a son to a god. See, and this is what it says on the inside, on the outside of the Dome of the Rock. It says, we believe in God. God is one. He cannot have a son, does not have a son, right? It says it many times all over the Dome of the Rock. Go look it up. It's very intriguing. Um, and, and one of the reasons it's, a, it's, a, it's an abomination. It's an abomination of desolation because it's an abomination against Christ. Because it literally says it all over the Dome of the Rock, inside and out, that, uh, that God cannot have a son. Well, who are you to say God can't have a son? Are you God? So it, it's illogical for you to even say such a thing. You, you can't say what God can do. Of course God can have a son. If he wants to have a son, he can have a son. He can have a daughter. And he could have something else, sheep of another pen that we don't know about. Who knows? You know, he could have whatever he wants because he's God. But, uh, but, but how dare you assign a son to God? Well, you don't understand God. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. He came and tabernacled among us so that we could understand God, right? It, you know, your brain, your heart, your lungs, which one of them is you? Well, they're all you, but they're all separate, different organs. They all have different functions, Right? And you can't live without any one of them. And yet they're all part of you. Right? So it's the same thing with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You just gotta you just gotta understand that. And uh, people have trouble uh, understand that. Yet God gave you a son so that you could understand. He gave you children so that you could understand what it is to have kids, right? So that you could understand God. And the latter of those whose lives are entirely given to the pursuit and manufacture of material goods. See, uh, materialism, which you know, which is true. Materialism is worldliness, you know, is uh you know, a decadence and, and uh, you know, Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon or the world, right? Uh, you'll love the one and hate the other to be devoted one, despise the other, right? So, you know, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, right? And so Jesus talks often about this, you know, what is it gain the good to gain the whole world yet lose or forfeit your very soul, right? Your very self. And uh, don't be afraid of him who can throw uh, your body into hell uh, or body I'm sorry, uh, who can kill the body. Be afraid of him who can throw both your body and soul into hell, right? So, uh, you know, there is this principle that Jesus talks about as well about uh, materialism. So that's very much uh, true. Um, yet they associate modern Christianity with being very materialistic, which, you know, they have an argument there because uh, there is a lot of materialism in, in the Western world. And, uh, and so, you know, they don't see that, that there are Christians among them who have rejected those things and have turned to God and are willing to give up everything. As it says in Luke 14, anyone who doesn't give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. So they don't really understand true Christianity. They're associating it with materialism, which is not accurate, uh, even though there are those who are very materialistic who claim to be Christians. So we have to balance that out, right? The attributes of the Dajjal has, as described in the Hadith literature are thus taken as symbolic representations and interpreted in a way that would make them compatible with Quranic readings. So all this is to help you understand the thinking of, a, of an average Muslim, right, and Islam, and why they're so anti uh, the West, and why they want to destroy Christianity, and yet they still believe in Jesus. You, know, you start to understand how, how they're reckoning all this, um, which make them combat with Quranic readings and not compromise the immutable attributes of God and Islam. The Dajjal being blind in his right eye while being sharp and oversized in his left, for example, is indicative of being devoid of religious insight and spiritual understanding. See, like, like Jesus said, because, you know, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty of sin, but because you claim you can see, your guilt remains. See, because you claim you can see, but really you're blind. But excellent in material and scientific attainment. See, this is what they see. So it kind of helps you appreciate, uh, like, okay, I can see where they're coming from, because I can see what they're talking about. I can see the materialism. I can see that's true, that we have given up on spiritual insight and turned to material things and, and science. It's all about science and science rules over everything. Uh, even though it's not really about science, it's about, uh, you know, fake science. But that's a whole other story. Um, you know, so yes, I, I, I get where they're coming from there. And so this is helpful, you know. So when you're talking to a Muslim, you can kind of say, hey, man, I totally agree with you about that. You know, I agree with you because that's not true Christianity. If you understood true Christianity, you understand it's not that. Similarly, the Dajjal not entering Mecca and Medina is interpreted with reference to the failure of colonial missionaries in reaching these two places. Right, so that's where they go back. They say, ah, the Dajjal, he won't enter those places either. Just like they were not able to enter those places, that must mean they are represent, representatives of the Dajjal. So now you can understand why they hate the West. 
because it represents the Dajjal to them. All right. Interesting. And I got a couple more things. I want to finish this off, and then I got a couple other things to share with you, and then I'm, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you for sticking with me, though. This is kind of uh, exciting things uh, to learn. I hope you fi find it as well. The defeat of the Dajjal in Ahmadi eschatology is to occur by force of argument and by the warding off of its mischief through the very advent of the Messiah rather than through physical warfare. With the Dajjal's power and influence gradually disintegrating and ultimately allowing for the recogni recognition and worship of God along Islamic ideals to prevail throughout the world in a period similar to the period of time it took for nascent Christianity to rise through the Roman Empire. Mm, okay, to cover by force of argument by the warding off his mischief. Okay, okay, interesting. In particular, the teaching that Jesus was a mortal man. Ah, see, it always goes back to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the Christ, guys. That's why, you know, nobody shouts Muhammad when they want to blaspheme. They shout Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ's name has power. That's where the power is. And that's why it always goes back to Jesus. Even Islam can't get away from Jesus. It's always going to go back to Jesus. Judaism can't get away from Jesus. They're denying Jesus, but they can't get away from him because they're looking for the Messiah, and he is the Messiah. So, you know, it always goes back to Christ, guys. You might as well just humble, humble out and accept uh, the word of, of truth that has been planted in you, which can save you. In particular, the teaching that Jesus was a mortal man who survived crucifixion and died a natural death as propounded by Ghulam Ahmad, has been seen by some scholars as a move to neutralize Christian soteriologies of Jesus and to project the superior rationality of Islam. See, it's always about trying to get rid of Christ. Isn't it crazy? They can't stand on their own. They cannot stand on their own. These religions cannot stand on their own. They all revolve around Jesus Christ. The gate of Lud, spoken of in the Hadith literature as the site where the Dajjal is to be slain or captured, is understood in this context as indicating the confusion of Christian proclaimants by way of disruptive engagement in light of the Quran. The Hadith has also been exteriorly linked with Ludgate in London, the westernmost point where Paul of Tarsus, widely believed by Muslims to be the principal corrupter of Jesus' original teachings. Whoa, that's huge. Okay, did you get that? Paul of Tarsus, they believe, who wrote most of the New Testament, to, they believe to be the principal corrupter of Jesus' original teachings. Wow. And he's thought to have preached according to the Sanini manuscript of the Acts of the Apostles and other ecclesiastical works predating, predating his discovery. Now, that's interesting because Paul today is kind of a point of contention uh, in, in, uh, in modern Christianity because people you know, start following the gospel of Paul rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's only one gospel, guys. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no gospel of Paul. Okay, that's a false teaching. It's not in the Bible. Um, Jesus was crucified before the creation of the world. It's, it's all going according to plan. Okay, and uh, Paul <laughs> was killing Christians and had to be turned around and uh, gotten on the right track. And he did get on the right track. And praise God for Paul. It's great to have him uh, as one of the greatest uh, apostles. Uh, you know, uh, going, getting out there and helping the Gentiles to be saved. But uh, but he but there's there is no gospel of Paul, guys. That, that's a false doctrine. But it's happening today. So it's interesting that they would believe that he, he was widely a corrupter. Uh, Paul didn't corrupt anybody, by the way. Uh, but people have corrupted Paul, unfortunately. Even Paul said, hey, was I, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Stop following Paul. Okay, follow Jesus Christ. It's thought to have preached according to Sanini manuscript in the Acts of Apostles and other ecclesiastical works, preaching his discovery. Upon his arrival in London, 1921, his son and successor, Proceeded directly to the site and led a lengthy prayer outside the entrance of St. Paul's Cathedral before laying the foundation of a mosque in London. Okay, interestingly. Okay, just want to wrap it up with a couple other thoughts here uh, that were kind of interesting uh, as well, including uh, what ties into the two witnesses. Uh, I found this very interesting. Okay, so check this out. When the Dajjal comes, okay, it says two angels resembling two prophets, one on either side will accompany him. And this, I think, is why... Uh, the beast that comes out of the sea is going to kill the two prophets, ultimately. And, and, and they're going to think they did something good because they're going to believe, I would think, I would guess, that these two witnesses are these two false prophets of the Dajjal. Um, I, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that that may be the case. This will be a test to, uh, to test mankind. Hence, the Dajjal will ask, am I not your Lord God? Do I not give life and death? Right? Now, I don't know if that's the case. This could be also the it could also be the false prophet um, and the beast and the dragon, right? The dragon being the Dajjal, and then you got the false prophet and the beast. So it could be that as well. But I just want to throw that up at the but which would be more accurate. That would be the accurate interpret, but it could be misinterpreted. They might misinterpret the two witnesses as being these two angels. Uh, because they see that they're doing miracles and they see that they're stopping the rain and they're changing the water to blood and doing some intense things and fires coming out of their mouth. So I, you know, they, you know, there's a good, good chance they're going to think they're going to miss 
misapply that to them. You know, Lord of the Flies kind of thing like, uh, you know, they're going to kill, kill the wrong guy. You are a liar. Uh, however, nobody will be able to hear this reply. Okay, so here's the thing. They say one of the angels will reply uh, to the Dajjal that he's a liar. Uh, the second angel addressing the first angel will say, you're speaking the truth. Everybody will hear what the second angel said and will think that an angel is testifying that the Dajjal is God. Though in reality, the second angel was addressing the first and agreeing with his reply that the, Dajjal, the Dajjal is a liar. So that's kind of interesting because they're basically saying that these two witnesses really don't support the Dajjal. They're against the Dajjal. And that's why I think it lead, lends them to being the two witnesses because the two witnesses obviously are against the Antichrist. The Antichrist, whether it's, you know, this dude in uh, here in, uh, where, where is that picture of him? I don't, uh, I forget where it is. Uh, where is he? Uh, this guy here, you know, whether it's this guy here or some other guy, you know, the two witnesses are going to be going, no, he is not the Christ. He's not the Messiah, right? And so, um, so they are basically saying that, these angels, but the people don't hear. They don't have ears to hear, right? They're blinded. They're deaf. And so they don't hear, and they think what the angel is saying, that yes, he is God, and they're declaiming the Antichrist as God, and therefore they will, uh, they will be against uh, these two angels. So it's kind of an interesting twist, an interesting uh, connection there. The Dajjal will cure those born blind, restoring their eyesight. He will cure lepers. So he'll be just like Christ, right, he will do those uh, miracles, false miracles, whether false or, 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 or real, uh, it, it won't be the Christ, right? Because uh, we know how Jesus returns. So very intriguing indeed. And um, so where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with a greater understanding of who this Dajjal really is. And I hope uh, that you enjoyed this exploration of the Dajjal. I hope to come back. I may, I may do another one, another one in a series here on the Mahdi and other eschatological, uh, the Al-Yamani, the Sufiani, uh, Jesus in Islam, uh, of course, the Mahdi, Sayyid Khorasani. They have a lot of interesting end time characters. So we may be exploring this again soon. But thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, wishing you guys all the best and all the blessed. And may the Lord uh, uh, make his face shine upon you, be merciful to you, and turn his face toward you and give you peace. Wishing you all the best, all the blessed, and Maranatha.